Okay, so what has become the uh, longest single shutdown has continued now. We're at uh, 34 days as of this time of taping. Maria Teresa, do you see any willingness on either side to get this done anytime soon? I think especially with what happened yesterday with uh, Donald Trump uh, basically folding over to uh, on the State of the Union um, shows that he could capitulate. And I think by next Wednesday, you'll probably see him uh, accept whatever Nancy Pelosi gets or what the other side uh, want to give him. So I think by next week, you'll probably see some uh, some more capitulation by Donald Trump. How's this going to play out? Well, I, I don't agree with that. I think that he, he did uh, uh, talk about the fact that he's not going to do the uh, State of the Union until this whole thing is settled. And, and the reason he gave is because, I mean, it's one of the most important speeches. It is in one of the most important places to be able to give it. And I think he, he, he gave specific credence to that concept, where it was at. Um, so I, I, I think that... Um, uh, he will be giving the speech eventually. I don't see him as capitulating because uh, there are centrist Democrats now, uh, several of them, by the way, in the Senate and the House, who are now saying to Nancy Pelosi, just shut up and give him what he wants. Let's vote on it. Let's give him what he wants. Uh, and a couple of them have said, I can't remember the names offhand, a couple of them have said, actually, uh, we want to make sure that the money is spent where it's being said it's going to be spent. We want to be able to make sure that we kind of can oversee the fact that it's going for certain uh, areas of reinforcement of fencing or walls or creation of certain ones that a wall that needs to be up in a certain area. We want to be able to make sure that we're kind of involved in that discussion. But uh, you've got centrist Democrats in the last couple of days now, just two, two, three days coming out and, and putting pressure on Nancy Pelosi. Um, she hasn't caved yet. That's absolutely true. But I think with the more centrist Democrats that come out and put pressure on her, um, I, I think you're going to see uh, some movement on her part out of necessity. In all fairness, there are a couple of Republicans who are now starting to come out and waver a bit, uh, not, not as much in, uh, in, in the Senate as the House, um, because uh, Murkowski and Collins have just come out and said that they will vote for, um, for the president's uh, you know, two plans that, that he's put forward. So it's, it's a standoff. I mean, it's a standoff. Where it's going to be, I mean, next week when we're back here, it'll be interesting to see, you know, exactly <laughs> what movement was made. It will be on uh, day 42 at that point, or 41. Possibly, that's possible. I, if, if that were the case uh, when we taped this. Um, some, no surprise, uh, Governor Sisolak wants to see the minimum wage at $12. It would be a four-year increase. Uh, do you see the legislature passing that and putting that plan into happen? And is that enough? Is that where it should be? Um, I think you're definitely going to see the legislature pass something, um, you know, uh, but is it enough? I think he's going to face a lot of pressure from uh, especially the folks that want to see it at 15 at least. Um, I think at the end of the day, though, that uh, and most legislators will probably agree on both sides that something does have to be done and increase it at some point this session, because the longer we wait, the more we'll have to increase it whenever it does get increased. So there will be some negotiations. Um, I don't know if it'll be 12 um, for a lot of folks will want more than 12 uh, or, you know, probably 15 at minimum. But um, it's going to be an interesting fight uh, that will definitely split some Democrats and we'll see where they're going governor and at the end of the day what the legislator lands on. I, I think that's a good point. You're going to see the Democrats somewhat split on the issue because uh, their, their uh, some leadership I think is in, in favor of 12 an hour. Uh, the more progressive wing of the party wants to see 15. Uh, despite that split, will they be able to coalesce and, and get to 12 or get to that number? You know, there's an old cliche about well, watch what you wish for because you may wind up getting it. New York actually, as of January 1st, went from 13 to $15 an hour minimum wage, New York City. Uh, and uh, the result was a New York City Hospitality Alliance survey was taken after that. 75% of full service restaurants, 75% are going to reduce employee hours in response to this mandated wage increase, 47% will eliminate jobs in 2019, nearly half, and 87% and will increase menu prices this year. You know, when you start out at a low end of the spectrum to be able to make money and be able to get your foot in the door, it becomes often becomes a, a significant moment in your life. There was one uh, restaurateur in New York City who was interviewed uh, who talked about the fact that she's going to start having, she's going to eliminate uh, busboys or busing people from the table. She's going to have servers bust their own table. 
and one may say, well, well, so what? Well, you're eliminating a certain low-level pay position, and when you do that, you have to look at her restaurant in particular because the general manager of her restaurant right now started out as a low-pay wage uh, busboy and worked his way on up. Now he's a general manager of a restaurant. Those things won't be available in the future when you start pricing people out of the job market. So again, $15 an hour, $20 an hour, hell, make it $50 an hour, whatever, who cares? You know. But eventually you're gonna price people out of the market and you're gonna wind up having jobs eliminated, you're gonna have, a, a, you're gonna have people paying more for goods and services. And this is something that, again, watch out what you wish for, you may wind up getting it. The, uh, there are mitigating factors as well, right? Uh, lack of affordable housing is one that comes to mind as well. Uh, the balance that Alan talks about, uh, of course those discussions are being had. Are we at a, at a crucial point though? Are we at a tipping point or a crisis point? Absolutely. Um, you know, many, while many businesses and business owners, especially small business owners, will have to make those difficult decisions and that's understandable. At the same time though, the people that are trying to get their foot in the door still have those low paying jobs, they also can't afford housing or, you know, prices are increasing on certain things and they're having to um, b have their own balance and they want to see their minimum wage increased. It's definitely, you know, something that because it hasn't been addressed for so long, now you're kind of dividing people, the low paying jobs and the business owners that both have to look out for their own pockets. And that's what these uh, legislators and our governor is going to have to balance out at the end of the day. At the end of the day, something does happen have to be done though because those low paying jobs I think years ago it was easier to move up the ladder um, but now what a lot of people are finding is that they go into the low paying job and it's hard to move up because people aren't leaving those good paying jobs so you have people that are just stuck at the bottom longer than before and so that's why you're seeing this movement to increase the minimum wage because the movement up is a lot more difficult now. The minimum wage is no, never intended to uh, raise a family on you know I've got two kids and I've got uh, rent and I've got you know to pay for the kids clothing for school and and food and, and insurance and everything like that. It was never intended for that. That was not the intent. The intent was to get people an opportunity to get a foot in the door. Uh, and generally speaking, younger people more than, than older people, quite frankly. Um, I, I had a minimum wage job when I was in, uh, uh, in, in high school. And again, you know, I mean, I knew other people who did as well during the school year, during the summertime, those jobs will be eliminated. And, and again, that's not just me saying this, these restaurants in New York, half nearly half are going to be eliminating jobs. I mean, that means that a lot of people who've been making these these wages and been paying whatever they can, sharing rent with somebody else, they're gonna be out of a job. And that is not gonna be an easy thing for them to overcome. So again, you, 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 I know you wish for it, think it's great, but man, you ought to think about what the result and implications are gonna be. I agree with you. I think that they will wind up raising the minimum wage. I mean, they're gonna do it. But again, be careful what, how much you weigh, uh, raise it for and be careful what you ask for because if you get it, you may regret it later on. Is there an acceptable cost of living increase or something for the, so that the wage keeps up with increasing costs? You know, uh, the teachers in L.A. went on strike and they, they, they ended the strike after they got a 6% pay raise. Uh, and I understand that's keeping up with whatever people are getting now on a general basis. Uh, so yeah, maybe perhaps uh, you know uh, people could be motivated to be able to increase wages by whatever the uh, increase of inflation is or how the economy is going. That's a possibility, but but to do it legally, I mean to, to force people to do it, again you may wind up driving businesses out, and two you may wind up uh, eliminating jobs. By the way, New York City is the latest example because it just happened starting January first. But we've talked about this before on this show because the same thing happened in Seattle when they initiated a huge uh, minimum wage increase. Businesses not only went out, uh, closed up, but they eliminated jobs. And, and they took jobs and they, and they put two jobs together to make one. I mean, watch out. You know, this is a slippery slope. Uh, the big promise in this, this budget was that uh, eight and now the numbers are slipping me, but uh, over eight and a half billion dollars for the next biennium. Uh, all of the budget's going to get done without raising taxes. Um, there are some sunsets that were built, built in, obviously, in legislation, so those taxes just would not be allowed to sunset. So 
is that raising taxes and and to allow those to continue is that something that should be a two-thirds vote um, first, it should be a two-thirds vote. In 2015, when Sandoval uh, supported extending um, uh, t uh, revenue, existing revenue, that also required a two-thirds. So yes, on that. And um, I think that you know, extending the like the modified business tax and not letting it sunset, it's already existing revenue, so it's not creating a brand new stream of revenue. And so, but at the end of the day, it's the right thing to do. That's why Sandoval did it. Um, that's why it'll probably happen this time around because. We expect, I certainly expect as a voter and as a person that lives in Nevada, certain things like education, health care, and other things need to be funded at least at the existing level. So, uh, you know, I think it's the right thing to do and it's the responsible thing to do. Is that a tax hike? Do you see that as a tax hike? Well, here we go again, as the president once said. Uh, president once said, you know, uh, because um, we have these taxes that were promised to be sunsetted. Again, watch out what you ask for. You wind up getting it. Here you, you have a tax that's going to be have a sunset on it, and it was extended under Sandoval. Absolutely, it was. Um, and now it's going to be extended. It's going to be it's permanent. It's <laughs> never going to go away. When you initiate a tax, you'll never get rid of it. Period. End of story. Only one tax in my lifetime that I know of that was eliminated, and that was a tax on telephones from 1909, I believe. I could be wrong on the, the, the date, but it was in the, by 1908 or 9, and it had something, I don't know what it had to do with, but it was a certain tax telephone, and, and back in the 80s, I believe, they got rid of that tax. It was a minor, minor tax. I, that's the only tax I ever know of that's been eliminated in my lifetime. So when, you, when people initiate a tax, whether it's federal or state or whatever, and they say, oh, it's gonna be a sunset on it, lies, lies, and more lies. It's not gonna happen. It's never going away. I'm not all that sad that those taxes are there the way they are right now, even though I oppose them. The reason I'm not that sad is because, again, it acts as a bellwether in the future. When you start proposing taxes and say, it's good, we're going to sunset eventually, people have to realize that's a it's baloney. It's a lie. It's not going to happen. So uh, again, watch what you get for. I'm against raising taxes. I'm against, and, and the governor is too, except he doesn't mind extending the other taxes, which you know, is the same thing as raising taxes. I mean, with all due respect, yeah, it should be two thirds, of course. Will he get it? Yes, he will. Okay, so you guys are on opposite ends as to whether or not it is a tax increase. Okay, um, criminal justice reform. So uh, Metro, there, there are some efforts to reform lower level offenses and, and some other uh, bills that will go toward criminal justice reform coming up in the legislature. Uh, Metro, is at odds with some of them? Uh, again, we're at a tipping point where we're going to start seeing more of these reform bills coming uh, with a, a Democratic legislature, Democratic governor. Uh, how do you see some of this playing out now? Um, I think this is definitely going to be one of those uh, issues that is going to be very strong uh, on both sides. I think you're going to see some opposition, but at the end of the day, though, you'll see a lot of agreement that certain things do need to be done, especially to um, save the state money and for uh, certain folks that want criminal justice reform to actually start helping out the communities that have been suffering by incarcerating folks for nonviolent offenses for an extreme extreme amount of time. Um, so I think, you know, like in the report that Steve did yesterday, you know, there's going to be disagreements, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, saving a lot of the communities that are suffering because of this and in just incarceration and uh, at the end also saving money for the state is what's going to bring certain people together and come with some compromises. I think it's something that is worthwhile. Um, it's divisive for certain people, but um, it's something that needs to be addressed. There will be a fairly large focus on this education. Also, uh, one of the large topics that we're talking about being tackled at the legislature uh, is criminal justice reform up there on your list of things that you would say needs to be prioritized and tackled. Not, not totally, but I would say that I would look at uh, the issues on an individual basis. Uh, saying overall criminal justice reform doesn't mean a whole lot to me without looking at specific uh, issues. Um, I'm not sure how many people have been locked up for many, many years for nonviolent crimes. You have recidivists out there who over and over and over again, you know, commit crimes and you got three strikes and you got everything else. So I mean, eventually some people are uh, just going to be recidivists to the point where they're going to keep committing crimes and no education I don't think is going to help that at all. I mean, would I look at issues like um, uh, marijuana possession or, or I mean, for where I'm coming from, I'll be honest with you, uh, even uh, possession of drugs for personal use. I don't condone that. I would force people 
regardless of what the ACLU might say, I'd force people into uh, some kind of rehabilitation or give them the choice of that or prison if they wanted to. But I mean, I wouldn't automatically put people in, 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 in prison because they were possessing, whether it was Coke or pot or any of the other drugs for personal use. You're a dealer, I'd put you in for 150 years because I, I have no use for those folks. But in terms of people who use it, they got problems, you know, let's help them get a uh, overcome those problems. So I would look at individual issues when you talk about criminal justice reform and not just use the whole thing. One of the issues that concern me on a local basis, I'll just throw this out, I know you don't have that there, but uh, I've got to say this, we have a retiring city councilman in Las Vegas who's, a re, uh, who's they're talking about finding areas to uh, allow people to use pot in, you know, in, in these little uh, cafes or whatever. Um, and one of the things that he proposed, because you talked about Metro, one of the things he proposed uh, it was a coffin. Uh, he proposed the idea of allowing people to be able to uh, use pot where they have alcohol. So you mean, you know, you're going to have alcohol and you're going to have pot. So um, I'm, I'm thinking about this. I'm going, this is, is weird. Uh, first of all, Metro opposes this. They say this might be, I mean, people are going to be smoking and drinking. They're going to get in that car. They're going to be screwed up. And they're going to be on the roadways. Uh, you know, challenging you and you and me and, and, and my kids, and I, I don't like that idea. So I'm concerned about that. I, I don't think Coffin was thinking when he really did that, unless he was, uh, you know, buddies with somebody who owns a bar, and, and that's a possibility. They've also talked about the idea of allowing people to smoke in areas where a pot, where they, uh, they have served food. You can't smoke uh, tobacco in a, a restaurant where they serve food, but they're going to allow people to smoke dope in a, in a place where they're serving food. I mean, the, you know, where are we coming from? You want to talk criminal justice reform? How about some common sense reform, which I think we lack a lot of these days? <laughs> common sense reform. I mean, you could also talk about issues like uh, bail reform yep. or parole or uh, a lot of those other issues as well, not just mm -hmm. marijuana, which is also something that will be talked about quite a bit up there, though should be an executive order coming soon to uh, create another regulatory structure for that. But I mean, there are a number of issues. I, I, I guess it is perhaps disingenuous or not fair to paint all under one brush. There are a lot of major issues under that umbrella. Yeah, and I think that's part of the problem with the discussion of this issue overall is that it's always discussed as everything. But at the end of the day, um, if you talk to experts and people that actually work on advocating for this issue, you'll see that they know that there's different segments of this issue, different parts. Like, for example, drug offenses or nonviolent offenses. You know, figuring out what's just um, what's justice to uh, in that is you know sending them right to prison when you're just possessing. No, that's not right. And I, everybody agrees on that. So it is a very complex issue. It's one of those issues like, you know, immigration that is extremely complex. There's a lot to it. But at the end of the day, both sides, even if you disagree on certain aspects of it, you agree something needs to be done and it has to be common sense. I agree. And, and I agree that there are aspects of the criminal justice reform that we need to look at individually. The, uh, just to piggyback on what you said, though, and the, and the overall immigration reform, as they, comprehensive immigration reform, as they say, um, you have both sides wanting different things. And before you're going to pass anything substantial in that area, you're going to have to both sides come together and agree on everything. I think that's a little bit different than the criminal justice reform. So, um, you know, and how that's going to play out, nobody knows, especially on a, on a federal basis. Well, I think you will see that we'll see where the Republicans cross over and vote with Democrats, I think, on some of these bills. Uh, there will, I would imagine, some bipartisan, as you mentioned, common sense solutions where that will happen. But of course, I think you'll also have some party line votes as well. That's that's kind of a given. You will. And again, I, I agree they should differentiate between some of these issues. And you and I would probably agree on some of the things that they should be looking at. We already did we on have. a couple of them. <laughs> you know, we already have. And, um, and, and they want to look at bail and they want to look at parole and things like that. That's that's fine to look at it all again individually and then then use common sense when they when they vote on them. That's all. All right, well, we're going to find the ones you guys don't like. We'll talk about those next time. <laughs> thank, thank you both for coming in. Thank you.